Welcome to Bike Life Radio from KWNK 97.7 FM, Reno Bike Project, and BikeWashow.org in Reno, Nevada. We ride our bikes out into the world with a recorder, and we talk to people about their bikes and their lives. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. Uh, today, we're talking to the creator of the Ultimate Bike Share Program at Burning Man. It's free. Reno solar contractor Travis Miller started the bike program, worked with a group to start the bike program more than 20 years ago as a potential solution to the problem of people leaving Burning Man bikes at Burning Man. Before we get to that, the news. In international bike news in Nigeria, they have an idea for how to reduce car crashes, get more people to ride bikes. The director of the road transport and mass transit said, if more people ride bikes, well, there's going to be less car crashes. Uh, a big fight over a bike and parking is going on in Bristol, England. A family traded in their car for a cargo bike. Problem is, they can't take it into their house and they don't have a yard to park it in and lock it up. So in the street, they put, uh, they, they, they put in some planters where they can lock their bike and now they've been ordered to remove the planters from that parking spot, that car parking spot, but they aren't backing down. And they responded by lodging a complaint against the council in Bristol, saying that it isn't following its livability neighborhood proposal because there's no viable bike parking. With the end of the pandemic, people are getting off their bikes and back into their cars. Shimano says sales are down 18%. Anecdotally, we're hearing that it's a good time to buy a bike, but it's always a good time to buy a bike, right? In national bike news, 7 out of 10 people in major U.S. cities support a new e-bike act, according to a survey by ebikes.org. The congressional act would cover 30% of the cost of a new e-bike and incentivize Americans to trade in their car for an e-bike. Problem is, I don't know any e-bike shops that uh, take car trade-ins. The number of teens getting hurt and killed on e-bikes has caught the attention of two federal agencies, the Consumer Product Safety Commission and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. The agencies are evaluating how best to oversee the safety of e-bikes, according to a New York Times article about teens getting killed on e-bikes. In Indiana, bike mismanagement caused a major accident. A bike that was not secured to the back of a truck fell onto the highway. Two cars hit it and they were damaged and then some motorcyclists hit it too and they tried to get it out of the road and then one of them was hit by a car and had to be flown to the hospital. So make sure your bike's secured to your car if you're going to go drive it around. Even the most bike-friendly places in the United States have connectivity problems. In Sausalito, California, north of San Francisco, a bridge between Golden Gate Market and Princess Street is the only way to get between two places. Hundreds and even thousands of cyclists use it every day, but it has no bike infrastructure. Finally, the city council there has voted to try to get a grant to put a bike lane on this highly used street along with the sidewalks too. You're listening to KWNK 97.7 FM in local bike news from Bike Life Radio and BikeWashow.org. The Reno City Council has approved the first phase of placemaking in downtown Reno to hopefully improve the area. Unfortunately, phase one doesn't include bike lanes. Instead, they're going to offer property owners money if they paint the front of their building and get some tenants. As a reminder, the placemaking study recommended bike lanes through downtown as a major way to bring people down there safely and quickly. Bike lanes are supposed to be a part of Phase 2, and during comments at the city council meeting, they said that they're working on Phase 2 currently as well. The city does have a plan for a protected bike micromobility network downtown that is expected to come before council in September. Have you ever heard of the cycling legend Major Taylor from the 1800s? Well, the producer of a documentary about him is coming to Reno. Cyril Vincent is coming to the Reno Public Market on September 22nd at 7 p.m. Go to the Bike Wash Show Facebook page for more information. Youth groups that want to make a little money and learn how to run a bike valet can partner with Food Truck Friday and the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance. The event is now sponsoring bike valet until August 25th. Go to the Bike Washo Facebook page to sign up and volunteer. 
Burning Man is coming, and that means a flood of tens of thousands of bikes into our community. A reminder that the event is Leave No Trace, and that means don't leave your bike on the playa. Uh, take your bike with you, and if it's broken, then fix it with a friend and give it to somebody who needs it if you don't want it. E-bikes are causing a real problem at Burning Man. The organization is reminding people that the speed limit there is 5 miles per hour. Some e-bike riders are not following the rules, jeopardizing safety, increasing injuries, disrupting the playa's surface, and getting in the way of burners' enjoyment as well. In 2022, they received a lot of feedback from Black Rock City participants about e-bike safety concerns. Many are asking for a ban on e-bikes at the event. Ignoring speed limits could lead to an e-bike impound. Speaking of Burning Man, there will be a talk about census data and bikes at the event this year. The talk will focus on Burning Man as a laboratory for bicycle management and stories from people at Burning Man um, on bikes. The talk is on Thursday at 10 a.m. at Center Camp. That's it for bike news from bikewashoe.org. A reminder that Bike Live Radio airs the first Sunday of every month at noon, right here on KWNK 97.7 FM. Today on Bike Life Radio, Burning Man has just issued its 2023 sustainability report with a 10-year goal of being uh, better for the ecology of Earth to exist than if Burning Man did not exist. Um, you're probably saying, gee, Kai, why is, what's this got to do with bikes anyway? Well, some of the discussion in the sustainability report covers how batteries are better for, uh, better than fossil fuel, for instance, uh, cutting energy needs in half. But you know what is better than batteries? Human power, uh, like bikes, uh, not e-bikes, just human powered bikes. Here's how bikes used year round can offset emissions at Burning Man or whatever you do. It's called the 430 rule. An analysis by Trek in 2021 showed that if you ride your bike 430 miles, it becomes carbon neutral. You've offset the amount of carbon it took to produce that bike. And so your bike has become carbon neutral. Any miles that you ride over the 430, after that 430, you're offsetting other emissions, other car emissions. So, how do we get more people to saddle up and ride? Well, in last year's Burning Man Biketopia episode, for instance, we explored the huge challenge that novice bike riders face repairing their bikes. So, repair is one issue, right? Well, the Reno Bike Project has a solution for that, offering repair that starts at just 5 bucks. That project is funded by Burning Man Bikes. Another barrier to bike riding is just getting a bike. What if bikes were, well, just laying around and you could pick one up and then you could go for a ride whenever you wanted to to get to wherever you needed to go, to the grocery store or whatever? Well, that's the idea of the Yellow Bike Program, also at Burning Man, free bikes. It's not a new idea, and there are programs like it around the world, but sustainability of these programs is a challenge. Burning Man's Yellow Bike Program has been going on for more than 20 years now, so I think that makes it somewhat sustainable, at least in its current form, uh, with the infusion of new bikes every year from burners. Um, but by the way, Burning Man and Yellow Bikes ask that you do not leave your bike on Playa um, as, as a donation or anything. It has to be a specific kind of bike if you're going to leave it on Playa for the Yellow Bike Program. And then they often become overwhelmed with too many donations and they have to turn people away. So make sure that you take your bike with you when you leave Burning Man. All right, so we need to get back to the Yellow Bike Program, right? Because that's the focus of our interview today. We talked to Travis Miller, who uh, was th with a team that started the Yellow Bike Program. And we're going to dedicate the entire hour today to Travis Miller. Here he is, sitting by the pool at his home in Reno, drinking a beer. Um... My name's Travis Miller, right? Um, Renoite. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're, you know, I've been really excited about this, uh, interviewing you, and I think I've wanted to do it for a really long time um, because of your association and relationship with yellow bikes. Yeah, I think uh, the, the term yellow bike actually came from uh, some community yellow bike program, I think it was, you know, uh, Pacific Northwest somewhere. Huh. Um, so... Uh, despite the color of the bike, uh, the, the first one was yellow, and so the yellow bike 
name lingers on despite whatever color is chosen. Uh, for example, at Burning Man, right? The bikes, we, we went green, more visible on the playa, right? Easier, easier to identify. But, uh, but the idea of what a yellow bike program was, was some people at least knew what, what that meant. And so that's what we were trying to instill that concept of the community sharing program so there's probably a lot of people out there listening to kwnk bike life radio right now 97.7 fm and wondering the concept of a yellow bike you know like they have no clue what what that means what does it mean Uh, it's it really just means a a sharing program meaning the bike is there you can ride it to your next destination and leave it for the next person right and uh the uh you know the the program i was affiliated with stemmed from burning man and my association with Burning Man started uh, through friends dragging me out there. Happened to be part of a bicycle club, uh, the Black Label Bicycle Club. And so um, they were staff also uh, in the Public Works Department. And so I be- became staff and worked with them. And we gravitated towards working with the bikes. And bikes is a primary form of transportation at Burning Man. And uh, bikes is also a bit of a cleanup uh, scenario at the end. And so the idea to... Uh, deal with the leftover bikes at the end was really let's recycle this you know this uh issue that we have this garbage left and make it an asset and put it back into function at the following event and so that's how the yellow bike program was formed for burning man back in 2006 yeah so basically if somebody sees a a green bike and it's not locked up or whatever they can take it and use it right that's the idea of the that's correct and it's a specific color of green they're all the same it's very bright uh you know signal green is the specific color and they also have other markings on them that say yellow bike stencils and a little tag with the you know the rules of the program on them generally um so you know how to how to use the bike where where to take it if it breaks um you know instructions like don't lock it up right ride it to where you're going put it in the bike rack let the next person ride it to where they're going and uh the idea at burning man is if you can get enough saturation then there's always a bike there when you want to ride one wherever you're at that idea that concept has not really solved the the problem right um i don't think yeah i don't think it solved the problem at burning man it's certainly even less effective i think in uh normal communities i think it is more effective in the burning man environment you got a kind of a closed loop kind of infrastructure right um there's no there's no real strong interest for people to steal bikes and uh, sell them right on Craigslist because the hauling them out of the desert is the is a challenge, right? It makes uh, that kind of problem not worth the squeeze. So the fact that Burning Man's remote and kind of isolated lends it to be a more functional application of the of the program. You know, we had ideas. Oh, well, what if we try to bring the yellow bikes back to town and use them? for the same function throughout the rest of the year but the attrition and costs become uh, problematic right Um, so people running off with them chopping them up parting them out throwing them in the river those kind of things whereas uh, and i'm not saying those kind of problems can't exist at burning man but uh they're reduced right because the the value of taking one home with you is a, a much larger uh, idea than it, than it is if you live down the street, right? Yeah. Um, you don't have enough room for all your stuff to go back in the car already. So what do you think would happen if we brought a shit ton of bikes here that work and uh, and gave them away? Do we create a garbage problem or what? Uh, it's certainly possible. You know, I watched a very interesting uh, uh, documentary type show about um, some guys on a barge in the Netherlands fishing bikes out of the channel. They actually had to fish them out on a regular basis so they didn't damage the boats, right? So they had like hundreds of bikes every year getting pulled out uh, as uh, as trash. So bikes can be trash. Um, they certainly manufacture plenty of bikes that are trash uh, right out of the factory, right? Uh, so uh, when we did the first painting of our fleet of bikes, there they were uh, Huffies. And, and uh, someone in the shop made a big sign that said, Made in China, broken in the USA. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, um, bikes, uh, and certainly for the event itself, bikes were, uh, you know, a, cha- a financial challenge, a trash problem, a cleanup issue, right? And that's frankly how I got involved. I was working on staff 
dealing with the cleanup issue how and then going okay now what do we do with this we'd rather they don't all go in the garbage we'd rather they don't all go just to the recycled how can we maximize the value stream of of this right and we did a lot of setting up plans and donating to nonprofits and the tribal entities and those types of groups and there was still more so we're like well how can we also use some of this other stuff in other ways bringing it back to the event seemed like a way that we could we could uh, reuse the product, but also reduce some of the volume of garbage coming in, because pe- if, if it was successful enough, people could go, hey, I'll just ride a yellow bike. I don't have to go to the thrift store and buy something that's garbage that I'm gonna leave there because I don't care about it. Yeah, and, and talking about stealing, people are stealing yellow bikes. Like, they, they're, they're locking yeah. them up, right? Yeah. Like, and that's an interesting idea, uh, or painting it a different color. and. Like, uh, if you took a yellow bike and you locked it up, you've stolen the yellow bike, right? Uh, you've certainly uh, prevented it from being used, right? So that's, uh, you know, it's a problem. Um, the our whole idea was if once you get to enough mass adoption, yeah. then people go, oh, I don't have to spend the effort to cover this thing in tape and whatever so that people don't ride it away because there's always one there when I want to use one anyways. So why am I wasting my effort trying to hoard this resource, right? Yeah. Uh, and so to kind of simplify that idea, I use the uh, an experience that I had at work where I had a cup of pens and every day I would come in and all the pens were gone. And I, so I would go to the pen closet and get all the pens, fill up my cup every single day. And eventually I saturated the whole newsroom with pens and no people didn't say take my pens anymore so the idea is that if you saturate the playa with enough bikes then there wouldn't need to be any uh, people wouldn't need to bring bikes out and people would always have a bike there right right? and And you use your office analogy when that closed loop now if everybody lives in that office building and nobody leaves that that property for you know a period of time well the loss level is going to be lower Right, than if people are taking them home unwittingly over the course of time every day. Yeah. What What's your sense of why that concept hasn't really worked and there's so many bikes left over? Like, I guess it worked to some extent where it's reducing the trash to some extent. We're not sure how yeah. much. But. Yeah, I, w- I don't know that I'd say it isn't working. I think it's, it's hard to measure. Um, you've got a lot of variables to adjust for, right? The volume of the event itself has doubled in that time frame. Um, so from 2006, right? I think we probably had 35,000 uh, participants around, around there back then. So it was up to 80, 100 something now. Um, so there's that volumetric change. Um, is the uh, is the volume being left on site uh, less than double the po- if the population is doubled? I think it might be. So there could certainly be a measurable effect. But is anybody doing the math? Uh, maybe that's a nice job for the census folks, huh. right? Uh, kind of the questions for them. <laughs> the the organization had some kind of a focus. I, I was uh, I, we started the yellow bike program, but I became the bike pro- bike manager for the event. So, not only did the yellow bike program was our primary goal, but it was also distribution of information and you know kind of support us on the bike camps um, to some degree and just kind of uh, you know flushing out what the uh, event policies about bikes could be and and public information that kind of thing so i think the organization's taken it fairly seriously for the most part because it is the primary form of transportation at that event right i think they could do you know anybody could do better in in certain ways right it's a unique challenge though there's not a lot of uh similar models to work off for their application that event is a let's have a no rules kind of event so yeah. having you know coming in and saying i'm going to have let's, let's impose a bunch of rules is also yeah. kind of against the rules yeah. right so um um procedures you know and recommendations uh-huh. is kind of you know this you know yeah. oh we had some hard and fast rules right you know we uh like we don't speed we yeah the, the event has those we felt felt very strongly about people wearing pants on the community bicycles uh-huh. for example uh-huh. right yeah. it's uh you know uh <laughs> <laughs> totally uh the i had an idea that I, I came across and watching you know some social media videos or whatever and there were like these surprise speed bumps uh if you were going a, a certain speed in your car then it would pop up a speed bump and okay. you would and you'd hit it with your car but there's also a speed bump that's made of a particular kind of material that if you're going slowly it's not a speed bump but if you're going fast it is a speed bump like it won't it won't uh collapse 
um, if you're going too fast. And so one of the thoughts was just put a whole bunch of those out there to keep people going from too well, fast. I don't know if bicycle speeding is ever that big of a problem. I think it's actually becoming a bigger problem now that you're seeing e-bikes. Right. That is now a problem. And, and You're listening to KWNK 97.7 FM, Bike Life Radio. And e-bikes are a bigger issue in general, right? Uh, especially when we're talking about waste streams, right? Uh-huh. Um, yeah. You take something, you know, it couldn't be quite, nothing's quite as efficient as a bicycle, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's about as good as we've got in, in human technology as far as efficiency uh, is concerned. And then and you kind of corrupt that a little bit when you go e-bike, in, in my sense, you know? So I'm disappointed. I, you know, part of me wants them uh, for, for that event application to say, we don't, don't even allow them, right? The speeding's a problem. The battery waste is a problem. Let's just not have them at all. The, you know, everybody here's got, or 90% of, 99% of people got two legs. Let's, uh, you know, yeah. it's, the, it's uh, why the application fit in the first place, right? So... Um, I don't I hadn't know. I even thought of that. I don't, I don't know, know why I didn't gonna think do that, that or anything. But uh, you know, <laughs> I, I you know, transparency. Uh-huh. I haven't worked there for you know twelve years, yeah. right? So I'm I'm far removed now, and the program still exists, but it's been through you know a few other uh, generations of management after after my time, and uh, you know they're great, and I, we still go visit and hang out with them during the event, um, but. The uh, DPW or yeah uh-huh. yeah. So back to no pants on bikes, uh, really quickly. Why? Uh, it just seemed like a health uh, concern. Did you the know, health department say it or no? Department. No, but but my crew did. Right, we're the ones <laughs> we're the ones lo- picking them up and putting them in trucks and putting uh, them on our bike stands uh, and working on them. Uh, and and you guys like to touch the seats. Well, we, we don't love to, but you know, yeah. you want to. You know, uh, yeah. it's just a kind of in general, people are gonna touch the seats, yeah. right? So it's you know, it's it's just common courtesy. Were there any indications that people weren't wearing pants? <laughs> Uh, really? People were yelled at for not wearing pants on their yellow bikes? That's correct. Really? Yeah, it's, there's there's rules right on the tag on the bike with the rules. The first rule is wear pants. Oh, right? yeah. oh I didn't uh, realize yeah. that. Huh. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen one of those tags. I have seen yellow bikes, but I've never seen uh, a tag with yeah, the instructions. Yeah, they laminated instructions tied to them. Huh. The era of, of, of less pants is fading from the event in general oh. o- over time. 20 oh. years ago, there was a lot less people or more people without their pants ah. just in the general public so ah. i think that's kind of a change of the culture ask the census people right what's the change in percentage uh-huh. you know i started pants or no pants uh, yeah no. yeah i started going in 2002 people yeah <laughs> nude your know, public nudity uh-huh. was i think uh-huh. far more common then huh. uh, at the event yeah. yeah i didn't realize that there might be a question on the census do you wear pants or not pants right. or, you know which do you prefer and, yeah. and maybe it, it's a little bit more like sophisticated than that about nudity yeah but uh yeah (laughs) yellow bikes are really green that's the color of the free bikes at burning man so uh look for them travis miller a solar contractor in reno helped uh create the program 20 years ago um to solve the big bike trash problem we wrote a uh, we wrote a request for a grant from the org actually the first year for a small um, budget to uh, purchase a, a, some you know tools bike stands tools you know basic supplies uh, you know uh, greases and you know lubes and chains and things and uh, and we started the, the pilot program was in 06 with I think 60 or 75 bikes we actually brought them to Reno fixed them up here you know worked on them in our backyards with our you know our, our friends and uh, and hauled them out huh 60 bikes and now and, and when you left how many were there do you know oh uh, that's a good question um we there was a there was a large donation of a thousand bikes uh mm-hmm. after the pilot year program from an anonymous donor and so uh, it, it it grew really quickly all of a sudden we we're like hey you got a donation can you put these things together and paint them and get them ready in four weeks you, you know you went from 60 to a thousand that's right 60 to a <laughs> thousand <laughs> what, what happened uh, in your mind then um well it was a it was a bit of a scramble right we had about four weeks notice and uh we had to pull together some you know uh, some of our friends that were available and we we fabricated a paint booth system on a track in the middle of the desert and uh, and uh you know kind of made it up as we went along Huh. Yeah. Were they in boxes? Yeah, they came brand new in the boxes, just like you'd see them buy them from Walmart or something, right? Huh. Um, so, wow. yeah. And so, 
plenty of trash and boxes and things. We, we there was actually an idea of what how do we build an art project with all these boxes, right? Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> Did and, you do anything? Well, we stacked them all in uh, uh, garlic crates. They're they're just a wood pallet type of crate that uh, the event happens to use from the garlic farms up north, and uh, they so we had a dozen of these crates full of you know broken down cardboard um and uh somebody decided to move them too close to a burn barrel mm. and then there was a uh, a situation uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I got i got the call i'm like what are you doing i'm like i didn't do anything and they're like you need to go fix it i'm like what do you fix want me what? to do yeah. <laughs> uh, this it's on fire what uh, I yeah, call somebody with a heavy machinery or something yeah. <laughs> Huh. So and they did. They you know yeah. the the heavy machinery team you know scooped it up into a burn platform and cleaned it up. But uh-huh. uh, but uh-huh. it was flying cardboard across the desert for a, you know a half hour there. Uh, <laughs> flying burning cardboard. Flying burning cardboard. Yeah. yeah. So um, it wasn't a good look. It wasn't the way it was supposed to go down. Yeah. You know? I imagine us building some like a card castle kind of thing or something. Uh-huh. But uh, but obviously that never happened. So yeah. oh that yeah. would have been really fun and neat. It, it would have been fun, right? But we didn't have the bandwidth, right? We were uh-huh. we we. We only got 85, 90% of the uh, donations out the first year because we only had an average of like eight people putting together a thousand bikes in, in a paint process. We actually took them out of the box and stripped them down further, right? Removing yeah. sticks and stuff to, to paint them and then reassembly. So it was a, uh, it was quite the process. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so then after that thousand, then what happened? Um, the net, well, we just get we uh, we store them in uh, in semi trailers and reuse them year after year, right? Um, you know, same kind of process at the beginning of the next year, repairing, repainting what was damaged. Um, eventually, you know, new uh, some of the leftover other things got cycled into the fleet, right, uh-huh. to help maintain the numbers as attrition happened. So, and that process is still going on. Huh. We actually started promoting people, if you're going to bring your own bike, or if you're coming from out of country and you're bringing a bike, well, get one like this, a single-speed cruiser, and then you can donate it to the program after the, at the end of the event instead of <clears throat> ditching it there for someone to clean up or, you know, or hauling it to, to town and ditching it at the airport or something. Yeah. So is that actually another way to solve the problem, right? And at what point did you stop or start to think like, hey, maybe I shouldn't do this anymore? Uh, 2011 was my last year working for the event, so I put in my decade. I had small children, there were three and four at that time. Um, so life life kind of uh, restricted my ability to designate seven weeks a year to, to that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that uh, was a contributing factor. Um, so, uh, yeah. And, and how did you get involved? What you know? Did, were you a bike guy before, or what? Yeah, I had friends that worked on public DPW, and uh, and they were uh, in in a bicycle club, um, and I was a member of the bicycle club. Uh, and then they dragged me out. Hey, come work with us out here in the desert, right? right? Yeah. And and since we're a bicycle club, well, we're we're the natural fit to deal with the bike stuff, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. I did other things uh, while I was there. I worked in their metal shop and on the transpo team and stuff. Uh, the first number of years I was there until the bike thing really took over. You've been going since. Do you have any, any thoughts about the role of, of bicycles there besides the e, you know, what you've already expressed yeah, with e-bikes? I think that e-bikes is my, kind of my concern for the direction of things. Uh, I, I, I kind of I have my misgivings. In, in, the, in the rural world, I'm an electrician, right, and I, I own a solar company, and I do solar projects, and people always talk to me about solar at Burning Man. And uh, I had a friend huh. said, hey, I'm building a trailer that's uh, a e-bike trailer with a battery storage and solar on top um, so that the, uh, they can charge their bikes, store them in the trailer. And then when they get there, unroll them, charge them, uh, you know, and ride them around today and recharge off the, off the system, basically. Um, and, uh, but he didn't know how to hook the solar stuff up. So we, we collaborated on that. Um, but I always had this weird, like, I don't even know if I want to be supporting uh, bringing this type of infrastructure out here right i'd rather those people just you know peddled <laughs> yeah um so i had mixed feelings right I, i'm i'm i i have a interest in clean energy and environmental footprints and 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 e-waste is not really you know conducive right you need yeah. some minimum amount of that kind of stuff to make renewable energy systems function but also managing it and not getting you know carried away with it 
everybody having a disposable battery hooked to their bicycle that's they can just pedal is kind of one of those things like did we just go a step backwards right uh-huh. <laughs> yeah yeah um a step backwards from kind of the goals of burning man or from the goals of clean energy and cycling right i think uh-huh. but the bicycle is like the most efficient perfectly engineered form of transportation uh-huh. ever designed uh-huh. right yeah, yeah. and now we're going to make it have extra waste yeah. Right, <laughs> uh, yeah. make it have extra waste and make it like not really have to pedal it That's anymore. Right. It's not good for you. It's not good for the uh, uh, mm-hmm. the environment. It's kind of uh, making something that was kind of perfect in its simplicity something less so. Mm-hmm. And you you get the counter argument that uh, people that wouldn't be able to ride a bike are now going to older people, out of shape people, mm-hmm. and maybe there's some truth to that. Um, um, where's the, where's the di- dividing line, right? Mm-hmm. Um, are, are more people riding bikes and it's offsetting the extra waste value because they're not driving combustion engines? That's a benefit. But if you have all the people that were riding regular bikes now riding e-waste bikes, that's a negative. So somewhere in there, you know, you there's a, there, there's, there's a cost-benefit relationship that's not exactly, you know, always positive. I drive an electric vehicle, right? I think uh, I think the math says that it has an improved uh, footprint versus a combustion engine, as far as at least carbon footprint and stuff. It's, it has it does have a, uh, its own footprint, though it's not perfect. Um, it could definitely improve, um, but generally, I'm a guy that's trying to drive things that direction, right? And and applications to something like the bikes go in the wrong direction. So. Um, Again, I'm a solar contractor, so I'm about making clean energy, right, and uh-huh. distributing clean energy in an efficient manager manner, right? And uh, um, you know, efficient use of energy means that you need less of it, right? So whatever the most efficient way you can be, the uh, the, the less resources you're going to consume. I mean, I always uh, I always appreciated people's creative ideas of way to use uh, pedal powered functions at the event for other. You know, whether it be just tandemized bikes and kind of a group pedal uh, art car things to pedal powered art events or, or art pieces themselves. There haven't been a lot of those, but there have been some. Yeah. Um, so um, I saw a can crusher out yeah. there that was pedal powered, yeah. which is pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, back, uh, God, 25 years ago, I designed a burn barrel that was pedal powered really and it was just uh it was just a made out of a regular barrel a 55 gallon barrel and then some structure on the outside and it was a carousel with horses and stuff and you could sit around it and the one seat had the pedal you could pedal it and spin the barrel while uh, it's so burning it was, while it's burning just slowly in a in a, in a you know circle huh. but uh you know so you sit there on the bicycle and pedal it and watch the barrel turn yeah. with the fire coming out of it it was like a entertainment while you ride sure. i guess yeah. or exercise yeah, or? It's a, yeah it's a fixed exercise bike right with with blinky light functions huh. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> before we had all the leds and stuff this was back in two th- the 2000s right before huh. uh before uh the mass adoption of all that kind of blinky light uh debris yeah so if you had put a wheel on that then you could have ridden around with your fire certainly you could have it was it was not small it was the barrel but it was the whole thing was about five six foot in diameter so uh it wasn't it wasn't well engineered enough i don't think to drive it around (laughs) maybe version two or three could have got there (laughs) what happened to it uh it got scrapped uh huh. Yeah. Um. I was on staff, right? We, all our stuff would go back to the work ranch at the end of the year and go into the, the rows of of stuff that we would use to cut apart and make new stuff uh-huh. down the road. So huh. neat. What um? Do you have a, a a a bike story from the playa that you remember that you want to talk about a little bit, bike or story. or one that sticks out in your mind? Uh, to be honest, I, I had an art car as well. So uh-huh. most of my years uh, working there as a staff, I actually was not on bike. Uh-huh. Um, so d- even though we were running the bike set, we were, you know, I was shuttling my staff around on, on an art car. Yeah. So uh, uh, kind of a weird uh, juxtaposition, right? Yeah, it is mass transit anyway. Right. So that's okay. Yeah. But, uh, uh, oh, I guess, yeah. uh, you know, we, uh, we started the first year, we built the, uh, and painted the bikes on uh, the uh, Org's work ranch about 25 miles north of the event and 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 we realized well now we have to transport them all into the event and it said well let's organize a bike ride oh. and so that well we we eventually started calling that the baloney hole blitz 
huh. the baloney hole was the name of the bike shop and so we would uh we would get everyone that wanted to out there and ride bikes in so usually 50 to 100 people uh riding down uh highway uh was it 37 there uh -huh. um is it, the... for a couple hours right with a pilot car for safety and stuff uh -huh. is always a pretty good time right uh -huh. and then kind of bombing into the city together oh, nice. so that's you know Memorable. Was that how you transported them all? Well, it's not all of them. That's how we transported as many as we could get legs to ride them, uh -huh. right? Huh. And that's a, a great way to do it versus putting them on a truck, I guess. It takes right. a little bit longer, but... Yeah, uh, yeah well, that, that first year, you know, we had a thousand of them that we had just been built and were, you know, so... Yeah, instead of loading, tr we loaded plenty of truckloads, but uh, we figured let's, uh, let's supplement it and try to make it an experience as well. When do they do it? Uh, uh, that actually occurs generally the Saturday, uh, uh, I'd say it was the Saturday before the event act formally opened, although I think it now opens on Friday or Saturday uh -huh. formally. Huh. So it used to be before the gates really opened, yeah. um, but now it's like, you know, with the early arrivals, basically the middle of the event, right? Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. The, balo the baloney hole ride. Yeah, the Blitz, the Blitz, yeah. Uh, Which, why, why the Blitz? Well, the Blitzkrieg is like, you know, the Germans invading oh. Western Europe in their tanks, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's where we were at Blitzkrieging. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Right. I had never it really... It rhymed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those, are, those are some pretty good uh, uh, stories from when you were there uh, working on these bikes. Did you ever see one that was really strange or, or see something that was done to a, a yellow bike that you didn't expect? Um... Uh, you've seen all types, right? And you see them wander out into the world where they're not supposed to be. You know, all those times that things happen. People call me still to this day and tell me they repossess one from here or there and bring it back. Uh -huh. So that's always kind of fun. Like from the from our world out here? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I was at Lake Tahoe once and saw one on top of a truck hmm. in a casino parking lot. And we, you know, threw it on the truck and took it home and left a note. Said, if you want to know what happened to the bike, call this number. Yeah. About an hour later, I got a phone call from the sheriff's department. <laughs> and really? they're like, we want to know what happened. And we're like, well, uh, we put the, put it back in the fleet where it belonged. And they're like, yeah. well, this person said they were gifted this bike. And we're like, yeah, of course they did, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it had, my, it had our name on it. So uh, uh, and we explained the system. And then I was like, call me back if you need to come charge me with something. But, uh, wow. um, of, of course, we never heard back. Right? So that's like the idea of like, hey, I have a bridge I'm going to sell you or I'll sell you this yellow bike. Would you like to buy it? Uh, or? Th there, I think, has been over the, you know, there's, there's been bikes that have been left and people have showed up coming back into the event with them mm -hmm. saying somebody gave this to me and huh. they've got it all decorated and like you have the the well this needs to go back into the fleet where it belongs maybe you're not the person who stole it but you're the one in possession yeah. right um and actually uh, over the years we developed an idea well we'd keep some of the leftover garbage bikes that fi got fixed up afterwards to in those scenarios hey you can't have that one but here's another one to take its place uh, right huh. so it's kind of a way to you know there, there have been angry people over the years who Spike got confiscated, who, you know, didn't understand that, you know, or had no idea that what they had wasn't theirs uh, initially. Huh. So there was kind of accommodations made to try to address that in that way. Yeah. They uh, really like them. Well, they had bought them in a thrift store, uh -huh. you know, because some had been taken the year, two, three years before and uh -huh. left somewhere else or, right, those huh. kind of over time those scenarios started to play out right yeah. and so we had to learn to accommodate them right we're not we're not trying to just be debbie downers and take away people's yeah. bikes that wasn't ever the intention yeah so yeah. you know it, it's a really interesting dynamic uh the the whole like uh not enough bikes and then there's too many broken ones and uh and too many ones that are left that still work and not enough people to fix them. Like, there's a lot of lot swirling around there. Yeah, and, and I think you probably just touched on the the worst part. The, the hardest part of that is not enough people that care enough to fix them, right? And maybe the resources are, you know, tubes and chains and, and chain tools and the basic equipment, right? Um, so yeah, definitely, uh, you got to show your appreciation of the bike uh, bike mechanics out there volunteering their time, helping folks out, because that's the 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 biggest resource that there's a shortage of, right? Uh -huh. um, so, you know, one of the things that I, I did last year, I talked to some of the camps and, and uh, came up with an idea of like a bike buck 
or something that you're issued when you come in and if you take it to a bike camp then you can get a free repair or they can teach you how to repair mm -hmm. um do you have, have you had any thoughts about you know how to solve this because if the if the problem is that people don't know how to repair bikes um then how do we solve that yeah well back when we first started we used to have a, a, a our our yellow bike camp actually at center camp and we had a couple of solutions we we had a we had a, a little miniature spire with a set of tools chained to it so that people could come that didn't have tools and repair their own bikes even if no one was working we also uh you know our staff was there for a month but and so the event is not they're not necessarily looking to work full time but we would incentivize them by having people come and barter right hey bring you you want bring someone to fix your bike yeah. yeah bring bring the mechanic guy you know meet yeah. him and then get gift him something that's you know, fits in with the economy right yeah. and the idea and make it worth his while to spend you know 30 hours of his burning man week uh fixing <laughs> random people's bikes right which yeah. can be fun for a little bit but can also get monotonous yeah. right so uh um i think probably all the bike shops struggle with that balance uh at some point and uh and so how do we train people though without uh you know or, or I know that we don't really want to have rules, but some kind of mandatory training that people can somehow figure out how to do basic repair. Yeah. It's, um, a, it's a consistent thing, theme that I keep on hearing yeah. from people. Well, I, I think that, I think that uh, what the Jackrabbit Speaks always has a bike issue every year. Um, I'm not sure when it is, and I, I can't tell you the last time I read any of them. But, uh, but I think they do have an issue that kind of tries to identify some of these things, things you should bring with you, minimum tube, you know, bring a tube, bring, bring a wrench, bring a, bring a spare chain, um, bring a friend that knows or, or have someone show you how to change your tube bring, before bring you come. Friend. Yeah, <laughs> bring a friend. Uh, um, so, because I mean, it's, it's not, I don't know that you can, Im I don't know if you can impress a capitalist market uh, structure there that solves the problem right you can't make a supply demand solution uh, necessarily because uh it's not about that yeah because yeah, there's plenty there's tons of demand but the supply is limited and you can't just make the the price exorbitantly high to bring the demand down yeah the demand's there but you can't say you know you, you can't all of a sudden have bike mechanics yeah you know uh you know taking people to the cleaners because they're the only guy on that ply that can help them right, right? right. so the capitalist market doesn't work yeah. and and so it's, it's an interesting uh issue and, and i mean good right mm -hmm. this is not the place for that kind of structure anyways yeah certainly uh self-reliance is uh you know i think it's one of the 10 principles right um for the event so uh, in that realm absolutely just in general life that's generally a pretty good uh concept right is he gonna uh save a lot of time and money um and maybe be more fulfilled if you are you know able to manage your own infrastructure in that kind of a way right bicycles an easy way to start learning the, the basics of of you know the way your life operates if you can't put a nut on a bolt then uh um you know you're going to struggle on a lot of other things besides just bicycles yeah so uh, thinking about your, your life after uh, this decade working on yellow bikes at, uh, at Burning Man and the, and the policies and things of that sort and, and, uh, and starting that program, uh, how has that, uh, I guess, impacted your life outside of Burning Man, would you say? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, probably how has it impacted my life outside? Uh, well... It, I always thought that working for Burning Man, their public works department, was good, uh, good training. You know, the, kind of the concept for them was always bringing unskilled labor and, and giving them an opportunity to learn new skills, right? I worked in their, their metal shop before even the bike thing started, and, and I had no experience in metal shop, right? My friend ran the shop. I learned all kinds of uh, welding and, and cutting uh, techniques and stuff, and those are things that I still use to this day. So that, uh, that teaching... Uh, philosophy i think is kind of an inherent in their public works and volunteering platform for the you know for the extent of this uh event so that's something i think that carries forward you know there's skills that i learned there that i certainly apply to uh my current occupation right i learned management skills in, in some ways managing volunteers and stuff and now i'm a business owner with employees and i'm i'm using some of those uh same you know things 
do you say like, hey, you know, when I was at the yellow bike program at Burning Man, I did this? Do you- no, no. Why we, not? No, be, because they don't take you. Yeah. They don't the take real you world up. employees don't take you seriously. If you, you know, they don't, they don't maybe understand the analogies quite as well as a uh, burner might, right? Uh, 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 huh. So they don't. Yeah. Uh. Well, I don't know. It may, maybe I'm just not the right person to express the the the, uh, the, the concepts that I learned. Um, uh, huh. But being open to teaching people is kind of, I think, uh, an imp- uh, a, a piece that the event has done right, right? Uh, um, huh. Transparency and not trying to, you know, trying to in- be inclusive and bring people in and, and, and support them in bettering themselves, yeah. right? And uh, so the bike program, where we, you know, 80% of the people that came and volunteered in the bike shop, you know, had never touched a bike, you know, before or at least a bike tool. Uh-huh. Uh, so... Uh-huh. Um, you know, um, I think that's one of the, one of the things I like about the event overall in general outside of bikes. Yeah. So you've got, uh, McKenna, your daughter, uh, working at, at, uh, the Kiwanis bike project or volunteering yeah. there, right? How did, how, it, 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 was that a result of your experience at Burning Man or how, how would you say that so. came about? Um, it's a good question. Um, she actually didn't talk to me about it before she was looking for places to volunteer. Um, um, for the summer, you know, um, pat, pad the old high school resume kind of thing, I think. And, uh, I think she thought, you know, bikes can be fun and, you know, not overly complicated and a known quantity. So I think there was something simpler for me there. I, uh, you know, she mentioned to me, I was like, why don't you go to the Vino bike project? Right. I, Noah is a good friend of mine. We've collaborated on a lot of things and she didn't want to, uh, she didn't want to be interacting with any of dad's friends. So that didn't sound, uh, that, that didn't sound like that much fun. So, uh, she found <laughs> some alternate out with dad. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I'm not down there to be fair. I don't do there, but, no, but uh, hanging out with dad's friends is like hanging out with dad that's possibly. Right. That's and right. yeah, I have to yeah. avoid that at all costs. Yeah. 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 yeah so they might've been, you know, too, too hip. Uh-huh. for her right she wanted to avoid the cool in crowd bike scene that apparently you know dad's friends think they're in that we're actually uh, well aged beyond that time uh-huh. <laughs> uh we're talking about the yellow bike program at burning man that's free bikes for anybody who wants to use them uh uh, solar contractor in Reno, Travis Miller, helped create the Yellow Bike uh, free bike program 20 years ago. The Kiwanis Club and the Reno Bike Project are both uh, entities that, uh, when I was running the Yellow Bike program, we identified and donated um, product to. And I think those donations continue in that resource has actually become an asset for both of those entities that helps them fund their operations and uh, be, and function stronger than most other uh bike programs in most cities so that's an interesting downstream effect and you know one of the reasons we did a couple things always with the yellow bikes we always ran a loss and found because uh it held people accountable right if you're taking a bike that's not yours you're taking it from someone else right that yes they might be looking for it and yes we're trying to return it to them and then the things that were left what we always try to stick to let's donate these to nonprofits, places that are you know have demonstrated a certain level of intent to do you know community work with them right Uh um and so uh um i think that has been helpful for those entities for sure and i I, you know i have friends in other towns and their their local community bike shop is uh a lot less well stocked and uh you know supported and struggles a lot more and so hopefully um, that's a nice byproduct of the event, um, bleeding over into uh, the real world here. Uh-huh. And maybe if we were to study how many people in Reno uh, know how to fix bikes, it might be higher than than maybe the rest so. of the nation yeah. or something. May- maybe they're training more volunteers here at the local shop, and that's going to, uh, at the end of the day, help supplement your demand there at the event for those mechanics. So maybe it's a uh, symbiotic relationship at uh-huh. some point. Yeah. 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 Well, not a maybe, but uh, it is, right? Well, I mean, you, again, have census, do the math on it, right? Uh-huh. I'm a math guy, right? Uh-huh. Uh, I'm an electrician. <laughs> Let's run the numbers and see what we're really working with. Uh-huh. And uh, you know, everything else is speculation. Yeah. Um, but but theoretically, it's you know, <laughs> yeah, you, you're doing something right. You're probably going to have some positive benefit, unless you're missing out on the big detrimental pieces that you didn't realize you were making. Yeah. <laughs> what about uh, the idea of like a bike yard? Everything is just put into a big giant pile, and then people mm-hmm. can go in and 
pick it apart as they want. Well, in 2004, we were, you know, we were hauling away bikes and still donating, the, but my roommate and I had a five acre field in our backyard with about 1200 bikes in it. Wow. So, um, and the neighborhood kids were picking it apart just fine. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, are you talking about a, a junkyard, a, yeah. an effect, a pick and pull of yeah. sorts? Uh-huh. Yeah. If it works for cars, then why not for yeah, bikes, right? It certainly is an idea. Um, I mean, you'd have to have, you get some way to fund the model to, to pay for the space and the insurance and the gate and the, you know, and the, and the dog. Yeah. The dog yeah. on the chain, right? Yeah. yeah. You need the junkyard dog for sure. And you put those pieces together, you might have a good idea there, right? Huh. Um, uh, maybe the Kiwanis Club or the Bike Project want to be in charge of that. I don't know. Um, it makes you, uh, you know, how long is the resource going to last? Is all, all the good stuff going to go first? But if you have a big enough stream, it's the same thing. You have enough big enough stream, at some point people stop hoarding and go, oh, I'm just going to use what I need. Yeah. Right? And, and so that's say, the mentality we want to overcome. Yeah, when you say hoarding, uh, like describe that a little bit more when we're talking about that in terms of bicycles. Well, people hoard anything in their life, right? If you see something, you, hey, you don't have a bicycle and you want to, and and there's a bike that can be ridden and you want to ride a bike, then acquiring one to take with you and acquiring a second one so your friend can go with you is an idea of let me gather resources, right? Yeah. And and humankind is in, kind of ingrained to gather resources, yeah. and uh, and we're not really ingrained to accept that we have sufficient resources and to try, you know, um, and if we can recognize those resources that are, you know, plentiful already that aren't in short supply, the demand goes, if the demand goes down, then uh, the, the, the existing supply can meet the need a lot easier and then we consume less. Uh-huh. And, and I guess a part of that, and, and people might not like to hear this, but uh, is being able to cope when you don't have the resource. So like if you gave away all of your bikes and then you don't have one, wow. Uh, suddenly uh being able to cope with that situation right right oh absolutely um people don't recognize that uh those things tend to work themselves out right i i have a bike right over there i i used to take it to burning man i don't anymore anytime i need a bike there's one there for me right (laughs) and so why why do i need to worry about you know transporting mine or or bringing other stuff uh because the um there's there's even with a thousand bikes with a hundred thousand people is one percent of the population riding the bike at any given point maybe Mm -hmm. maybe one percent maybe as high as two or three percent but 90 something percent of the time you're not riding a bike even if you like to ride bikes and you're there right and you're sleeping for 30 percent of the time and then you're eating and then you're drinking and you're doing all the other things so what is really the resource demand and uh can you you know, can you make uh, minimize the actual resource and spread it around to meet the demand? It's just like a ride sharing thing, right? You got your uh, zip cars, right? Doing the same thing. Um, share those, right? Why own a car if you can just, you know, drive one when you need one? Yeah. And I, I guess the, the part of that is the it's mine yeah. idea, right? Yeah. And so this bike is mine, and no, you can't borrow it to. Yeah. ride somewhere right and that's part of over that, that needs to be overcome as well as right? americans it's built into our dna right consume consume gather acquire build build wealth and power and you know and be in control of your own destiny yeah. right and those are uh uh those are ideas that sometimes lead you down a path of spinning your own wheels or do, you know working harder than you need to spending more than you need to for the same result so and thinking about that, do you uh, have you seen people come in from other countries and they're like, "This is ridiculous," or "Let me share a bike," and or or you know what kinds of things have you the, seen? The folks at the event that were the the best users of the yellow bike program were generally the foreigners coming from a, out of country, right? They had the hardest time bringing a resource. Um, they maybe had less of that American. I need to own everything of my own uh, mentality, and so uh, they fit. They just kind of fit into the program more naturally. Huh. Um, God, I wish that uh, I wish that manufacturers would stop manufacturing garbage, right? Um, you know, uh, planned obsolescence, right? Products that are only going to last for a year or two, right? Bicycle can last a really long time if it's built well, and uh, and can break really quickly and not be repairable if it's not. So you know, 
mass produced uh container garbage is uh you know is while it's a bicycle it's still you know can be part of the problem um you know i've had uh discussions with people about that and they've even had experiences where something that they've purchased at walmart is garbage immediately um and then talk to them about how they should go to a particular place like Kiwanis or the Reno Bike Project and buy there. Um, even though it's used, it's probably much, much better because it's, somebody's gone through it and, and they know that it's good quality when they start to work on it. But then that person will go back to Walmart anyway and buy stuff, uh, you know, even though we've had the discussion about how they're buying garbage. So. What do you think's going on there? Uh, I, just lack of understanding. Uh, those people aren't the ones that learn how to wrench on their own bikes, right? So you teach them how to wrench on the bike, they'll pretty soon realize uh, that which ones they want to own and which ones they don't. So maybe that's part of the solution. I tell you, um, from the time we started the Yellow Bike Program till when I left, and probably even more exaggerated today, the quality of the garbage left behind has gone downhill uh, tenfold, right? There used to be gems and like really nice bikes that were you know like put this aside and make sure it gets fixed up and support something or gets donated to some yeah. kid and uh and uh the quality is is uh nowhere near what it used to be so um that probably is a major contrib- contributing factor to the additional uh demand on repair camps uh-huh. and the additional amount of debris left over behind because if it breaks twice as much if it breaks it's less likely to be taken home right yeah. well and the, and i guess that kind of goes to the impact off playas that uh you know kiwanis and reno bike project are selling out almost immediately of everything that they've got and they've been working on all year so bike project has 1600 bikes and they sell out immediately mm-hmm. and kiwanis has you know hundreds and they sell out immediately and that shows the demand for that service um and expanding that service can be, I guess, a, a challenge, but uh, is an opportunity potentially. Yeah, potentially. Um, you know, um, what what path does that opportunity take? Does someone start a bike manufacturing retail uh, a distribution system, right? And can they make a quality product and compete for that dollar of the weekend warrior uh, that's, uh, you know, just wants to ride it for seven days? Um, maybe. Um, there's certainly a percentage of those that want to take something home and own it forever, I guess. Um, but, uh, but most are just coming out and riding for that weekend and then yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. And there's rental programs. Um, people have tried to, uh, uh, implement some of those, I think to some success. Yeah. And, uh, that's maybe a good part of the solution as well. That's, you know, different solutions for different, uh, folks, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a it's an interesting challenge for Burning Man culture, right? Yeah. Um, not, I'm, we, I grew up was there, and the you know this isn't a for profit event, right? And um, people rent them in town and stuff. But it, it's it's a uh, it's interesting. Anytime I see somebody's business model is Burning Man related, right? Go, oh, okay, that that's weird. <laughs> it makes sense, but it's weird, right? Um, so I don't know their whole, bi- their it, whole it's business never model. Never the relationship I would want with the event, right? People <laughs> renting RVs and that, you know, being vendors of some kind. No, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I want to help out, but then when I'm done, I, you know, I don't need to depend on this. You know, I, I wouldn't yeah. want to have to depend on it for my thing or be liable for uh, somebody else's thing out there. You know, at, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm at Burning Man and you know, yeah. I'm clocking out and going to the event. We've been chatting with Travis Miller, a solar contractor in Reno, who helped start the Yellow Bike Program at Burning Man more than 20 years ago. It's free bikes. Wow. Uh, Remember, if you're going to the burn, make sure that when you leave, you take your bike with you, whether it works or not. Uh, Leaving it on Playa is matter out of place and uh, considered trash. So make sure you take it with you. You can donate it in Reno at the Reno Bike Project or Kiwanis Bike Program. That's it for Bike Life Radio. We ride our bikes out into the world, talk to people about their bikes and their lives, hear their stories. Bike Life Radio is made possible by BikeWashoe.org and KWNK in Reno, Nevada, owned and operated by the nonprofit bike shop Reno Bike Project on Grove Street. I'm Kai Plaskon. Ride on.